The Judiciary Committee will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recess of the Committee at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on oversight of the U.S. Copyright Office. I will now recognize myself in opening statement. Today's hearing will allow us to assess the current state of the Copyright Office and the U.S. copyright system. Each year, core copyright industries employ 5.5 million workers, produce $1.2 trillion in economic activity, and generate roughly $180 billion in foreign sales. These industries also promote a wide range of artistic expression and intellectual thought. The Copyright Office plays a vital role in helping to uphold this system and in helping to ensure that works are effectively protected by copyright. Maintaining this vibrant copyright ecosystem depends on having an effective Copyright Office to oversee it. And we are pleased to be joined today by Karen Temple, the Register of Copyrights and Director of the U.S. Copyright Office. This committee held its last Copyright Office oversight hearing in 2015, four years ago, and a lot has changed since then. Notably, last fall, Congress passed the Orrin Hatch, Bob Goodlatte Music Modernization Act, which provides critical updates to modernize the music licensing system and better serve both creators and digital music providers. This historic legislation, which I was proud to help author along with the ranking member, Mr. Collins and Mr. Jeffries, assists digital music providers with the licensing of musical works, while also ensuring that performers, songwriters, and other music creators receive fair market value for their work. The Copyright Office is responsible for implementing several features of the Music Modernization Act, or MMA, including aspects of the blanket license established in Title I of the Act. The Office's July 8th deadline to designate the Mechanical Licensing Collective and the Digital Licensee Coordinator created by the MMA is fast approaching. And so I look forward to hearing more about the status of the Copyright Office's work in implementing these and other provisions. The committee is also closely monitoring the Copyright Office's much needed efforts to modernize its IT systems. In recent years, we have heard a consistent message with respect to the Copyright Office that the office must be modernized to meet the needs of the public and the copyright community and to reduce the backlog of pending registrations. The Supreme Court's decision in Fourth Estate Public Benefit Corporation versus WallStreet.com which held that registration, and not merely the filing of an application for registration, is necessary before a copyright owner can sue for copyright infringement, further underscores the need for modernization of the office's IT system. Following the Fourth Estate ruling, I wrote a letter, along with Ranking Member Collins, asking Ms. Temple about the office's plans for reducing registration processing times in light of that decision. I appreciated the thorough response and her testimony on the same topic today on the office's plans to speed up the registration process. These efforts should remain a top priority for the office. Another timely issue is the upcoming expiration of the distance signal satellite television license at the end of this year and whether Congress should reauthorize it. Ranking Member Collins and I also wrote, recently wrote Ms. Temple a letter on this topic. Again, I appreciate the thorough response and I hope we will be able to explore more of the office's rationale for recommending that the license be allowed to expire in light of the changing media landscape. In addition, the office has been studying the effectiveness of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, Section 512, Safe Harbor Provision. This issue exemplifies the critical role that copyright law plays in balancing the needs of right holders to receive value for their works and the interest in, of the public in having access to information. I look forward to learning more about the insights the office has gained over the past few years in the forthcoming report. I thank Ms. Temple for being here today. I congratulate her on her recent permanent appointment as Register. I look forward to her testimony on the important work of the Copyright Office. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. from Virginia, excuse me, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, not that there's anything wrong with Virginia. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, has been a good partner and an important leader on many copyright issues, and it is now my pleasure to recognize a distinguished ranking member of the Judiciary Committee for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and just for anybody out there who may have gotten any wrong impression, go dogs. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thanks for having this hearing today. There are many ongoing copyright issues that deserve our attention, and you and I have a history of working on these issues together in a very bipartisan way. I'd like to see this committee focus more on issues like copyright that are critical to our economy and represent areas where we have, uh, can actually legislate and get things done, rather than redoing a lot of what we have been redoing recently. I also want to thank Ms. Temple for uh, appearing for us today. It's good to see you, it's good to have you here, and it is good that you are permanently there, and I'm glad to have them. It's her first time appearing before us as the officially appointed Register of Copyrights, but she is by no means a stranger to this committee or to copyright law. Um, 
Copyright is a right provided for by the U.S. Constitution. Strong copyright protections are critical to promoting innovation and creativity, and they're critical to our economy. According to the Intellectual Property, International Intellectual Property Alliance, core copyright industries contribute more than one trillion to the U.S. GDP and make up almost 7% of the U.S. economy. The Copyright Office plays a key role in this system, and we, can, and we in Congress are fortunate to have their advice and analysis on numerous policy matters. Last year, the Music Modernization Act was signed into law. This is a bill of a culmination of years of work and the first major update to the music and licensing system in a generation. The Copyright Office provided its expertise throughout the process and is now in the process of implementing the law. We look forward to hearing how that implementation is proceeding and to continue to work uh, with the Copyright Office to ensure that this law is functioning as intended. In addition to the Music Modernization Act, there are numerous other copyright-related matters that deserve our attention. Copyright modernization remains a priority, and the Copyright Office, as the copyright moves to a new IT system, we must ensure that it has all the resources that it needs to fulfill its unique requirement. I am still believing that it needs further change and needs to be continued in this, and I would hope that the, actually the librarian would actually join us in this and not hold us on this, because this is something that needs to happen. The committee has jurisdiction over satellite compulsory license for distant signals, as the chairman had mentioned, section 119. We have heard from the Copyright Office about its belief that the license should be allowed to expire consistent with their historic opposition to statutory license. While not all expiring Stella provisions are in the jurisdiction of this committee, this committee should review those that are. We must also ensure the copyright system functions well for content creators and content users who rely on it. Too often today, we are seeing small creators effectively sidelined from enforcing their rights. That is why I'm glad to see that the team is back and Congressman Jeffries and I are again with the CASE Act. And for those in here who sell the shirts, that is something important to me. In just a moment, if we forget the creators, if this body forgets that it is the original idea, that spark, that hope, that dream, that idea, that music, that poem, that verse, whatever it may be, that comes from within someone, if we ever get to the point where that is not valued in our system, when we ever come to the point where in creative spark, in whatever genius it may appear, is not protected under our system, our basic civilization goes down. Because it is those moments of spark and creation and hope that the Case Act would allow for people to, to enforce their rights. But it's also that spark that keeps us going. And it's not for us in this room. It is for those who are going to have that next spark tomorrow, that next song, that next dream, that next book, that next moment that will literally change the world. That is why I love being a part of this committee on most days. <laughs> but we'll continue. Piracy also continues to be a problem. While registration uh, pendency times have gone down, questions still persist about how to protect property rights properly as well as, work, as, as works are registered. Piracy can happen in seconds, but registration can take months. I commend the Copyright <laughs> Office efforts to shorten pendency, but these are questions that we must consider. We must also work to ensure copyright laws, many of which are decades old, reflect the needs and realities of today's digital world. They are not in competition. They're in a mutual symbiotic relationship if we allow them to be, and we need that. Many challenges remain in the copyright ecosystem, but I'm committed to finding solutions. I look forward to hearing from the register today and to continue the bipartisan work to strengthen our copyright system and ensure it is working for all creators and content users alike. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. And I will now introduce today's witness. Karen Temple was appointed Register of Copyrights and Director of the U.S. Copyright Office on March 27, 2019. After having served as Acting Register since October 21st, 19 did I say 19? 2000, after having served as acting register since October 21st, 2016. Previously, she served as associate register of copyrights and director of policy and international affairs for the Copyright Office. Before joining the Copyright Office in 2011, Ms. Temple served as senior counsel to the Deputy Attorney General of the United States. She earned her JD from Columbia University Law School in my district and her BA from the University of Michigan. We welcome our distinguished witness, and we thank you for participating in today's hearing. Now, if you please rise, I will begin by swearing you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and beliefs to help you, God? Thank you very much. Let the record show the witness answered in the affirmative. Please note that your written statement will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there's a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. 
Ms. Temple, you may begin. Good morning, Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to provide important updates on the operational and policy activities of the United States Copyright Office. Mm -hmm. For nearly 150 years, mm -hmm. the U.S. Copyright Office has been at the very center of a thriving copyright ecosystem, serving as the primary federal agency administering the nation's copyright law. During that time, the U.S. Copyright Office has registered over 38 million claims to copyright, representing even more individual copyrighted works. We have provided crucial advice on copyright law to executive agencies and courts, engaged in a wide variety of public educational outreach, and answering almost 200,000 public inquiries just last year. We managed over a billion dollars annually in statutory licensed fiduciary assets. Importantly, through our traditional role as the key advisor to Congress on copyright policy matters, the Copyright Office has participated in every major update to U.S. copyright law, from the development of the 1909 and 1976 Acts to the recent Music Modernization Act. The Copyright Office's legal, policy, and regulatory activities support our cultural and economic well-being. As recognized by the U.S. Supreme Court, copyright is intended to be the engine of free expression and U.S. copyright law ably fulfills that intent. Congress developed a thoughtful balance of rights, exceptions, and limitations, which promote the progress of our nation's culture from traditional creative industries to the flourishing tech landscape. With this robust framework of rights and limit limitations, it is not surprising then that the United States leads the world in both entertainment and technology. Indeed, according to recent estimates, Core copyright industries represent nearly 7% of the total U.S. economy and add more than a trillion dollars to the U.S. GDP. The Copyright Office is honored to be a critical part of this copyright ecosystem. Since the Copyright Office last appeared before this committee for an oversight hearing, we have made tremendous progress on a variety of initiatives, including in operations, law and policy, outreach, financial management, and modernization efforts, which are described in more detail in my written testimony. The Copyright Office work supports all affected by copyright. When many people think of copyright, they often think of major corporations and large businesses. But those are not the only ones who are supported and who benefit from copyright law. What is often overlooked is that copyright also supports and sustains small businesses, individual photographers, and artists, first-time novelists and bloggers, garage bands, and independent filmmakers. By providing a way for these creators to make a living doing what they do best, copyright enriches our culture and enhances our daily lives. Every time I hear from an individual creator about the first time they registered a copyright with our office, or the first time they actually were able to make a living doing what they do best, I am inspired. It reinforces in a real world and practical way the important work we and the entire copyright law do for our nation. This includes, of course, an essential framework of exceptions and limitations like fair use that also helps and support and sustain a vibrant and flexible creative culture. The importance of copyright to individuals and smaller businesses is one of the many reasons that the Copyright Office strongly supports a voluntary small claims tribunal. The Copyright Office has studied this issue for well over a decade, listening to the views from all sides, and has come to the conclusion that many simply do not have the ability to enforce their rights or contest claims of infringement. A small claims tribunal would go far in ensuring that those granted certain legal rights under the Copyright Act actually have the ability to enforce them. I look forward to continuing the Copyright Office's progress and service to the country, to help guide the way, the Copyright Office released a new strategic plan just two months ago. It identifies critical focus areas that will chart our course over the next four years. None of this work, of course, would be possible without the dedicated staff of the United States Copyright Office. During my tenure heading the office over the past two and a half years, I have been continually amazed and inspired by their resilience, flexibility, and support during a time of tremendous Copyright Office growth and change. 
Copyright Office staff often work long hours with limited resources. Their efforts have resulted in the recent elimination of our backlog of pending claims and significant reduction in the processing time for registration applications. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank the exceptional Copyright Office staff for their contributions to the U.S. copyright system and the American people. I would also like to thank Congress for your ongoing support of the Copyright Office. I look forward to working with you closely as we continue to modernize and update the office and the copyright law for the benefit of all. Thank you. We will now thank you very much. We will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Ms. Temple, the Mechanical Licensing Collective will be authorized to distribute unclaimed royalties to rights holders. We have heard from some stakeholders with an interest in the process. For example, I received a letter from the Recording Academy on this topic, which I ask unanimous consent to place in the record without objection. Ms. Temple, what are the Copyright Office's views on how the MLC should handle the initial distribution of these funds? And in the Copyright Office's opinion, what are the best practices the MLC should employ to ensure that unclaimed royalties have a chance to reach the owners of works that are currently unmatched? Uh, thank you very much for the question. As you know, um, we in the Copyright Office, and I know Congress, believes that the most important aspect of the Music Modernization Act is to ensure that songwriters and musical work copyright owners are actually getting paid for their work. Uh, one of the issues with respect to the Music Modernization Act and the MLC will be distribution of those royalties to everyone who's entitled to them. Uh, we were b very pleased that both of the submissions uh, by entities who have been requested to de be designated as the MLC have have uh, made this one of the priorities in their submissions. We are also uh, very helpful, looking forward to working with Congress um, to ensure that those royalties are distributed appropriately. Uh, for example, under the MMA, we are uh, required to do a study on best practices to ensure uh, that matching is, is working appropriately and to reduce the amount of unclaimed royalties. So we will be beginning that report uh, shortly after the designation, and that report will be given to Congress as well as to the designated MLC in July of 2021, and they are expected to follow uh, the best practices that the Copyright Office uh, actually uh, provides in that report. And additionally, we were pleased that both of the uh, entities that wanted to be designated as the, uh, as the MLC have agreed uh, that the first di distribution of unclaimed royalties cannot occur until 2023. This will give an, uh, them both an opportunity, or the designated entity, an opportunity to ensure that they have good practices in place uh, to make sure that they are able to distribute to the most people and have the least amount of unclaimed funds. Thank you. And once the Mechanical Licensing Collective is designated, the Copyright Office will have to draft rules for how this entity will function and operate on a day-to-day -day basis. How does the Office plan to conduct the forthcoming rulemaking proceedings, and how will you engage stakeholders, including the new mechanical licensing entity, in that process? Yes, we were very pleased at the um, amount of regulatory authority that was provided to us and the confidence that Congress provided to us in the implementation of the MMA. Uh, we're focusing, as you know, right now on the designation of the MLC, which we will do by uh, July 8th. After that designation, we will immediately start working on the regulatory other aspects of the MMA imp implementation. We have to provide regulations, for example, about the notices, uh, the form of the notices of blanket license, notices um, with respect to usage. We have to provide regulatory uh, information about uh, pr privacy and conf confidential information. So we will be uh, engaging in those rulemakings immediately. And then we also have broader authority under the MMA to, to effectuate the statute by regulations. And so we will look into whether we need to do additional regulations once the MLC has been designated as well. Thank you. And I'd like to ask you about the upcoming expiration of the distance signal satellite television license under Section 119. One concern I frequently hear is that letting this statutory license expire will result in thousands of people losing access to television. Since the office supports letting, this office, letting the license expire, what's your response to this concern? 
Yes, we have studied this issue in the Copyright Office for several years. As you know, we issued two comprehensive reports uh, in, several years ago re recommending that Congress allow that Section 119 license to expire. Uh, recently, at your request, we reviewed and analyzed um, th those issues again. We concluded that in the last five years, between 2014 uh, and 2019, the actual royalties that we received under the Section 119 license has uh, dropped precipitously precipitously. Uh, so it's dropped by between 85% to 99% in terms of the royalties that we come in. Uh, so that license is really not being utilized in the market. Also, we also noted that the marketplace has risen up to address issues with respect to uh, satellite transmission and that, that, that those underserved markets are not being underserved in the way that they had been in the past. The Copyright Office has always said that we view compulsory license licenses as only needed in market failure. And in this instance, we have concluded that there is no, no longer a market failure, failure that Thank justifies those, those licenses. Thank you. Let me get in one more question. I remain concerned about the pace of IT modernization at the Copyright Office, especially in light of the recent Supreme Court decision in Fourth Estate Public Benefit Corporation versus WallStreet.com, which clarified that registration is a precondition of filing an infringement lawsuit. In your view, what aspects of the Copyright Office are in most urgent need of modernization and has the Office of Strategic Plan prioritized addressing those needs? My time has expired. The witness may answer the question. Thank you. Um, yes, we agree uh, that IT modernization of the Copyright Office is one of the most critical priorities for the office. It was listed as a primary and core key focus area in the recent strategic plan that I just released. Uh, in terms of which areas need to be prioritized with our IT modernization, I will have to say all of them uh, because we desperately need to have a full enterprise copyright system that is a, an integrated system that addresses both our recordation aspect of the Copyright Office our registration and our public records. So we are actually engaging in modernization efforts on all three of those different areas at the same time because they are such a priority. Thank you very much. My time has expired. I now call on the, uh, and I recognize, I should say, the uh, ranking member, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In 2013, the Copyright Office recommended the creation of a small claims court and recommended legislative language that eventually resulted in the CASE Act that uh, Mr. Jeffries has done so eloquently talking about, and I've joined on, uh, with him in that, H.R. 2426. In your testimony, you discuss some of the challenges faced by small creators in the office support for small claims tribunal. Can you talk about uh, this and, and your support and how we would go about that? Yes, the U.S. Copyright Office has supported um, developing some type of alternative forum for small individual creators and smaller businesses for some time. Uh, if you may recall, Representative Smith had a hearing in 2006 on this very issue with, in which the copyright testified and said that this was a worthy issue to study. In 2013, we provided a, a full report after a public process where we received a number of comments looking at this issue. We concluded that unfortunately, with, re with respect to the current system, due to the high cost of federal litigation and the complexity, many individual creators and smaller businesses are essentially precluded from getting into federal court to uh, really protect their rights. And we have noted that having a right without a remedy really means that you have no right at all. And so it is our strong view that we have to provide some alternative forum to allow for those individual creators and smaller businesses to be able to protect their legal rights. Uh, we noted, and others have noted, for example, that the median cost of of a litigation is over $200,000 to um, be able to litigate that uh, to a jury trial. And so that is something that is really just beyond uh, the, you know, the ability of most individual creators and smaller businesses. And so that's why we strongly support the creation of a, a copyright claims board. Yeah. And, and I think, it, look, it's, it's in this, uh, so did in this audience today, I think this is something that we, that, again, we don't often go to the doable here many times. This is doable and should be uh, as we go forward, and I think it's something that, that would really uh, work. I, I want to go back, uh, let me switch gears, and I want to come back to the office itself, but the committee recently received information from you regarding registration processing times, and I read that letter to say that registration backlog was, was basically gone. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we were very pleased that we were able to eliminate our historic backlog of pending claims. How does what does that actually you know actually mean, and how does that uh, you know how do you avoid a return to a backlog? 
That's a crazy, great question. Um, uh, we have typically counted our registration backlog of pending claims to be at a hundred, to be over 150,000 workable claims. Those are claims on hand that have all of the materials that we need to be able to process the actual registration application, including the fee and the deposit, uh, and that are pending within the office. Uh, so that's traditionally what we have identified as a, a backlog, and we have gone significantly under that in the last year. But we do realize that that most people aren't as concerned about us, our backlog. What they're most concerned about is the processing, processing time itself. Uh, so we have really kind of switched away from focusing on the backlog to focus on what is the processing time for our claims. And we were very, very pleased this year to be able to say that we have, within the last two years, reduced the processing time by 40%. It's now not perfect, but it stands um, on average at five months. And we are working very, very hard to continue to improve that. Uh, elaborate on the dependency issue. What would cause, what's a problem that would keep you from getting better at that under five months? Well, you know, one thing that we identified or I identified in my recent letter to the committee was resources. Um, one of the issues that caused our backlog and caused us to have very high pendency times was that we actually had a reduction, I think, of more than 30 percent of our staff uh, over the last five years, um, or before the last five years, between 2010 and 2014. Uh, we lost a significant number of our registration specialists. Uh, we were very pleased that the committee has supported uh, the Copyright Office getting more resources. So so in FY 2015, 17, 18, and 19, we did uh, get additional resources from Congress to hire additional registration specialists. So having the, uh, the resource to hire staff is one of the most critical aspects of us being able to continue to have that processing time go down. Obviously, another key aspect is modernizing the office. Our system right now um, is not the most efficient, and we expect that once the IT system is modernized, we will be able to maintain maintain and even reduce processing times further. Look, I understand the delicacy of your position, and especially in dealing with the library and in, in the Congress as, Library of Congress as well, but it, it's an untenable situation. I'll take the heat for this. She, you know, the librarian can come see me about it. I don't care. Um, but this is the IT part of this and the other functions that you need to actually have an office that works has got to be, there's no turf battle here. In fact, there needs to be a removal of you from that turf at all together. But we need this IT issues and we need this to be broke up in a way that you understand the jobs that you do. I think you've done a great job and, and previous registrars as well, Ms. Plenty and others have a very great job of saying why you're different. You want to, the, the thing that has gotten me the most is y'all seem to want to work within a, a broken system as best I've ever seen, but yet you continue to get hindered at every time. So I, again, I'm, we're looking forward to moving more uh, in that direction. I'm glad you're here. Uh, thank you for your help and I yield. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Lofgren. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Ms. Temple, for being here today, as well as your terrific staff. Uh, you know, in all of the interface I've had with the office, I've been impressed by the dedication of the staff of the office, the uh, commitment they have to the rights of uh, people who are seeking protection, and uh, I just want to thank you and them you. for your hard work. You know, we have uh, an interesting situation. Actually, the House Administration Committee has jurisdiction over the library and every component within it, and we actually have had oversight hearings uh, relative to the operation office. The copyright policy is the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee. But in terms of uh, the IT system, we have received uh, very strong commitments from the librarian as well as from you that the IT system is well underway. Uh, and really, I think that is the, it was neglected for a uh, too much for a long period of time. We're playing catch up now. So I'm wondering, could you uh, give us a little more detail on the IT improvements and when we can expect to see them come online? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Uh, we have been working hard to improve our systems for some time. We, for some time, we've been in the planning stage for a long time, but we are now right in the position to be able to realize some concrete um, uh, successes from the modernization plan. So right now we have uh, three different areas, again, that I mentioned that we're focusing on. Uh, we're excited about uh, our recordation modernization. Uh, as you may know, our recordation system is still paper-based. Right. Uh, 
so that is something that it was long in need of modernization. We have been working on that for some time. Uh, according to our OCIO, who is actually here today, um, we are going to be able to release a public launch, uh, launch a public pilot of a new digital recordation system early in the spring of 2020. And so that it will so be next year. That Less will be than next a year, year from now. Yes. Uh, so that will be a tremendous, I think, advantage for the. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I wonder if we could have a little order so I can hear the witness. We will be in order. <laughs> <laughs> that will be a tremendous, I think, advantage for the public um, to be able to actually see this new digi digital uh, recordation system. The, the pilot will be small in nature, but it will enable us to uh, get feedback from the public on necessary improvements as we continue to develop. Uh, we are also working on our public records system. We are um, in the process of contracting with vendors uh, to be able to develop our pre public records, and those are our records of applications, registrations. Uh, the goal, of course, is to be able to connect our applications, our registrations, and all of our data uh, in one system so that the public will be able to get as much information as possible about copyrighted works and copyright ownership. So we're in the process of doing that. And then we have been working and, and on... And what's the date on that, do you think? I mean... This is good news overall. Uh, yes, we are hopeful that we would be able to um, have a pilot of the public record system uh, late next year, so late in 2020 as well. Um, again, that would be a limited pilot, but it would allow for us to have something concrete uh, that a limited amount of, pub of the public would be able to uh, utilize to provide input and feedback to us as we continue to uh, develop that system as well. And then finally, we have been working on our registration system um, that is as part of the overall enterprise copyright system, we have been engaging in a lot of public interface uh, to develop the, the, the frontal portal of that system. We have wireframes that we're working on. Uh, we've tested that system, the wireframes at least, with the public, and we're going to continue to do a number of kind of user usability testing, uh, UX, UI uh, processes over the course of the next several months as well. So really, we're on the verge. In the next year, we're going to see a huge change in the IT in the office, and I think that will benefit rights holders greatly. And you know, the whole trick here is to find out who to pay and to pay them. And that's really a matter of information and the ease of information. Let me ask you just a quick question on the uh, consent decrees. I realize that that's really not up to the office, but DOJ is now renewing its uh, review of this I don't know what's changed since the last time they looked at it, but it does seem to me that uh, for a broadcaster to be fully covered for any song that might, pl might play, the broadcaster has to purchase a blanket license from all four uh, PROs. Um, you know, to me, that seems complicated and expensive. I'm wondering if the committee asked you to whether you could study in the Copyright Office whether Congress should modernize blanket licenses for the performance of musical works the same way it modernized sound recordings and, mechan and mechanical licenses. Would that be something that would divert the office from its necessary IT upgrades or would that be something that could be accommodated? Uh, certainly, if, if Congress would uh, like us to review that issue, we would be pleased to do so. We obviously have been monitoring the, the consent decree process on the IP side. Uh, the DOJ is reviewing it on the antitrust side. This is an issue we touched upon briefly in our music licensing report that we issued in 2015, uh, where we did rec recommend, for example, that we migrate any rate setting to the CRB to be more consistent. Uh, so again, certainly we would be uh, definitely willing to continue to review that issue with Congress if you thought that would be My time is, is over. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for indulging me in that latest. And congratulations uh, on your appointment, Ms. Temple. Thank you. Oh, yes, I, I am uh, uh, remiss in not congratulating you also. Thank you. And welcome. Uh, the uh, gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ranking member's gone, but go Wahoos. Uh, I want to thank you for your leadership and Ranking Member Collins also, uh, Chairman Johnson and Ranking Member Roby for their leadership on intellectual property and, and uh, Congressman Jeffries for introducing the CASE Act. I'm proud to join him as a, as a co-sponsor of that bill. And uh, congratulations to you, Ms. Temple, on your appointment. Uh, uh, you've uh, done a great job and we look forward to many years of leadership from you. Copyright's uh, particularly important to my home state of Virginia. We 
have had around 100,000 registrations from Virginia over the last uh, six years, 12,000 jobs through the motion picture industry, uh, and 2,500 production-related jobs. And the software industry in Virginia has accounted for over 180,000 jobs. Copyright ownership brings jobs, steady wages, and money to our local economies. And we're here, and we've been discussing many of the issues surrounding copyright, including modernization of the Library of Congress, copyright registration process, music modernization implementation, consent decree, stellar reauthorization. Um, I want to focus on, on uh, digital piracy for a moment. Um, you know, it's uh, an oldie but a goodie, but uh, your, your office is studying Section 512 of the DMCA, which is coming up on 20 years of uh, uh, anniversary. Um, notice and takedown is, is a critical part of copyright protection, but a lot's changed in 20 years. Uh, many uh, advancements have not been anticipated. Uh, can you talk at all about uh, uh, the study, how it's going, and when you plan to release it? Uh, yes, we agree that um, you know it, it, a lot has gone on in the last 20 years, and that's why we were very pleased when Congress did ask us to study Section 512 and the notice and, and uh, takedown regime. We are in the process right now of analyzing all of the comments that we received. Uh, we received over 90,000 individual comments on um, Section 512 and whether it is operating effectively today. Uh, we also engaged in a number of roundtables. Our most recent roundtable was just earlier this spring where we wanted to make sure that um, we had all of the information in terms of updates that might have occurred since our last uh, set of written comments were requested. Uh, so we now have all of that information, the 90,000 comments that we are going to read, each and every one of them, as well as the uh, transcripts from the roundtables, and we will be drafting over the summer. We are hopeful that we will be able to release that report by the end of this year. Thank you. And as you said, uh, it's an important issue that uh, you've received a lot of comment on, and, and uh, video streaming piracy is costing the U.S. between 30 and 70 billion dollars annually, between 230,000 and 560,000 jobs, and between 45 and 115 billion dollars in GDP. Uh, can you explain how the office continues to monitor uh, video streaming piracy and work, and how you're working to address the threat of piracy uh, in this? ever-changing environment. Uh, yes, we, you know, obviously are not an enforcement agency, but we do ro work closely in the interagency with the rest of the USG um, to ensure that on the policy side we have strong protections against piracy. Uh, that's, for example, one of the reasons why we testified several years ago on the issue of illegal streaming. We noted that there has been, a, you know, a, an increase and a rise in illegal streaming even years ago, and that it would be appropriate at this stage for Congress to consider uh, providing parity in terms of. Uh, uh, the penalty, penalties for unauthorized reproductions, distributions, and public performance. Uh, unfortunately, under our current law, unauthorized public performances actually are not able to be charged as a felony, while unauthorized reproductions and distributions are able to be charged as a felony. Uh, as many of you know, streaming has risen in the type of distribution model that has been done uh, by the content industry, and so it's our strong view uh, that it's appropriate for Congress to consider providing parity for the penalties of all of the types of of uh, piracy that's out there uh, so that the uh, Department of Justice will have effective tools uh, to combat piracy. Thank you. And with a few seconds remaining, I want to address something you mentioned in your testimony, um, the eighth triennial Section 1201 proceeding that's going to begin next year. Um, you adopted a streamlined process during last year's rulemaking when you recommended uh, the renewal of exemptions for all 22 types of uses covered by the 2015 rulemaking, and you supported the expansion of seven of those earlier exemptions, the adoption of two new exemptions. Um, can you speak to the, uh, to the work that you're going to be uh, beginning and, and uh, whether you see anything different on the horizon? Uh, yes, no, we were really pleased at the outcome of our last uh, Section 1201 rulemaking. Uh, we did, as you noted, introduce a streamlined process. Uh, that process worked very, very well. Uh, so for those exemptions where uh, there wasn't really a change in the marketplace, uh, since our last proceeding, we instituted a process where an individual could come forward and basically note that and note that they were going to be relying on the evidence of the last triennial rulemaking, and then they wouldn't have to actually 
actually resubmit all of that evidence again if there weren't changes in the marketplace. And that allowed for those exemptions where there weren't really a significant amount of opposition for us to really be able to um, thoroughly analyze the previous record yet again, um, but not have the burden of those who are proponents of the exemptions having to uh, provide a new record that really had not changed. And that streamlined process is the process that we will be following uh, for the upcoming triennial as well. Great. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Georgia, Mr. Johnson, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for hosting this hearing, and uh, thank you for your presence to testify, and congratulations to thank you. you. I understand that the Copyright Office's IT systems are centralized as part of the Library of Congress's interoperable software programs. As a result, the Copyright Office must provide funds for its IT modernization to the library, only for the library to, in turn, provide the new services back to the Copyright Offices. What safeguards exist to ensure that funds designated for the Copyright Office's IT needs only serve the Copyright Office's needs once they are transferred to the Library of Congress? Uh, thank, for you, thank you for the question. As you know, uh, after centralization of all of the IT systems um, with management of the IT systems within the library, um, our IT ha is now under the authority of the Office of the Chief Information Officer. Uh, the way that we uh, do request additional funds for IT developments is we do have our own appropriation line, and we do request specific IT modernization funding. Once we receive that funding, we do transfer that funding uh, to the OCIO for use in the development act activities under the appropriations law. Um, they are required to utilize those funds and resources uh, solely dedicated to copyright office modernization. We do want to work with OCIO, though, to ensure that, um, that it is a transparent process because we know that stakeholders want to ensure that their uh, money and any fees, for example, that are going towards modernization are going specifically to uh, copyright office modernization. So we're going to work with OCIO to ensure uh, that we do have even better communication and more transparency in terms of the usage of our funds uh, for IT modernization. All right, thank you. How have modernization efforts in the Copyright Office been impacted by having to operate within uh, the Library of Congress? Uh, well, you know, it's certainly, uh, you know... I, I, may, I guess maybe I should ask, have the efforts of the Copyright Office been negatively impacted by having to operate within the Library of Congress? Well, I, I will say that it's certainly a change. Uh, we previously did have, for example, direct access to vendors where we were kind of, the business was guiding um, the IT development. And so one of the issues that I know is important for uh, myself as well as the rest of our staff is just to, to ensure that in this new framework that the Copyright Office still does have that direct access uh, to the vendors, to the contractors, so that we are actually the ones who are guiding the modernization efforts. Um, of course, the library also has a lot of priorities. They are modernizing other uh, aspects of their systems as well. And so the other uh, issue that we want to ensure is that um, when there are all these competing priorities, obviously we feel that the Copyright Office IT system is the number one priority. And so it's, it's my um, really hope that the librarian and the library will continue to have IT modernization of the Copyright Office as one of its highest priorities. And so that's really what we are focused focusing on ensuring that the business requirements and needs that we have for the Copyright Office are conveyed and listened to by um, those who are developing our system and that our system development remains a priority even among competing interests as well. All right. Thank you. Well, you'll keep us abreast of uh, how things progress. Yes. Uh, the distant signal satellite television license is set to expire on December 31st, 2019, and in your letter you reported that the use of the Section 119 compulsory license has decreased in the past five years, but there are still over uh, 870,000 subscribers. If we allow the compulsory license authorization to expire, then what will happen on January 1, 2020? 
Uh, yes, you know, we have said, you know, in our review um, that the marketplace has already risen up to address this issue. And so we do. How do, so? Uh, in, in order, for example, the marketplace, you have uh, different ways in order to get signals. For example, you can now um, watch on YouTube. Streaming services have risen up. And well, so. Now with broadband having not been extended uh, to uh, the far reaches of our society, of our country, um, that poses a problem. Well, I will say that uh, you know, in our review, we, you know, we we did hear from um, the satellite providers that there were about 800,000 sub subscribers. But one of the issues um, that we mentioned was one: the royalty rates have gone down significantly. Uh, again, that was an 85 to 99 percent reduction in the royalties that we receive. And even for that 800,000 numbers, it is not clear that those are all actually subscribers within households. Some of them are RVs and other. Um, types of um, uh, entities, and so we don't think that there will be a significant harm to rural communities by allowing this, um, this uh, license to, to expire. Again, this is something that we actually supported for many, many years. Over time, I think that it's even gotten better in terms of the marketplace, so we think that uh, even if it was something that was uh, useful a few years ago to allow the uh, marketplace to take advantage of all of the uh, advancements, it's even more so now because of the limited use of that uh, particular license. The time you. of the gentleman has expired. The gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Roby. Uh, Ms. Ms. Temple, I want to thank you so much for um, coming here and testifying today, and thank you for the time that you've spent with me in my office, and congratulations, and I look forward to um, working with you on ways that we can ensure our copyright system is working efficiently and effectively. So again, thank you. Um, as the co-chair of the Congressional Songwriters Caucus, um, I'm particularly interested in effective implementation of the Music Modernization Act. And I know the chairman touched on this, but to ensure that songwriters are getting paid accurately and fairly uh, for their work. And under the MMA, the Copyright Office must designate an entity um, to serve as the new mechanical licensing licensing collective um, by July 8th. And we talked about this some in my office, but as you review the submissions um, and prepare to make um, regulations to implement the MMA, can you speak to the ongoing transparency and oversight responsibilities um, of the MLC to ensure correct matching of data um, that will help ensure that songwriters are paid fairly? And then I'll just add one more thing. What would you recommend that we in Congress um, and particularly this committee do um, to provide meaningful oversight of the MLC and ensure that the MMA accomplishes its goals. Uh, yes, yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, I, you know, I, I think it, I, we were pleased by both submissions that we received in the Copyright Office um, for the entities who wish to be designated by the MLC, recognizing that one of the most important goals of the MLC is to ensure that songwriters get paid um, for the use of their works uh, and that th they reduce the amount of unclaimed, unmatched royalties. Uh, so that is something that both des both uh, proposed designees have, uh, have actually identified. Uh, one of the things that Congress has also already done to ensure that this process works effectively is to ask the Copyright Office, again, to do a study on um, best practices with respect to unmatched royalties and ways to reduce the unclaimed funds um, within the MLC. So that is one thing that Congress has already done. We will be preparing that report, uh, starting to prepare that report as soon as the, the designation is made. And again, that report will come out in July 21, where we'll, we will be recommending best practices and so I think once the report goes to Congress, as well as the MLC, ensuring that those best practices are actually adopted that we recommend, I think will be a key aspect of making sure that the system is working effectively. Thank you. Um, I'm an original co-sponsor as well of the CASE Act, and it's great to see um, so many creators here in the audience today. So currently it's cost prohibitive for many creators to um, enforce their rights in federal in the federal court. So, how will uh, a copyright small claims tribunal um, or the Copyright Claims Board in the Case Act not only benefit creators but also benefit users of content? 
Uh, yes, you know, as I said uh, earlier in my opening testimony, it's really important for this system to work to, that the legal rights that are created actually have the, the people have the ability to enforce those rights. And so with respect to many, many smaller creators, smaller businesses, individual authors, uh, right now the legal right is, 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 is there, but it's not effectively enforced because they don't have the ability to get into federal court. Uh, so having this new alternative forum, I think, will be very important uh, to really provide respect for the system and ensure um, that all who are supposed to benefit from the system are able to do so. One area that hasn't been highlighted a lot with respect to the um, CASE Act, however, is that it does also benefit users. You are able to, if you, for example, want to use a copyrighted work uh, and are unsure whether it is a fair use, you are able to go into the, the alternative form of the, the CCB and actually get a declaration, determinate, a determination of uh, non-infringement. Uh, so it's not just to go after those who are pirating works, uh, but those who are using works and want, um, again, the confirmation that they are allowed to use those works are able to go into that CCB with the streamlined process and get a, a determination of non-infringement as well. So speaking of piracy, um, my home state of Alabama, like others, have seen an increase in movie and television production, um, bringing jobs and opportunities. Um, but digital piracy remains a concern, and it, it can threaten um, uh, possible future productions. Um, the vast majority of people would never um, uh, think of walking into a store and stealing a DVD. Um, but don't give a second thought to uh, streaming movies or shows online from illicit um, sites. So what suggestions would you have, and I've got 18 seconds, on ways that people we can educate the public, um, and particularly young people, on the Ill illegality of, um, and harm of digital piracy? Uh, yes, you know, I think that often, unfortunately, when people think of digital piracy, they don't think that it really does harm individuals. Uh, they just see the major artists and think, oh, well, if they don't get paid for that one D DVD, it's not going to harm them particularly. Uh, but they don't realize the entire... Yeah, I didn't do it. It did go over. <laughs> okay, it's gone on again. Thank you. Uh, they don't realize the impact that piracy has not only on artists, but all of those who are really participating in the copyright ecosystem. Uh, so I think that, yes, as you mentioned, outreach and education on this issue is critical. Uh, teaching the young people that, you know, if you wrote a paper, you wouldn't want your friend to take that paper and, 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 and pretend that it was their own. Uh, that's basically piracy. Uh, if you draft a song and somebody steals that song. Uh, so I think, you know, again, once people understand the ramifications of how piracy really affects our culture and our ability to have a thriving uh, copyright ecosystem and a th thriving marketplace for culture, I think people will be more willing to understand the importance of protecting uh, those intellectual property rights. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're, uh, you're welcome. The time of the gentlelady has expired. The uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Jeffries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record several letters in support of the CASE Act. Without objection. Uh, thank you, and congratulations, Mrs. Temple, on uh, your permanent elevation to the position. Continue to appreciate the leadership that uh, you provide. I want to thank uh, my colleagues, Chairman Nadler, uh, Ch Chairman Johnson, Ted Liu, uh, Doug Collins, of course, uh, Congresswoman Roby, and uh, Congressman, Cl Congressman Klein for their support of the CASE Act. Um, Mrs. Temple, has copyright infringement increased significantly uh, over the last several years? Uh, well, that's, you know, an issue that we have studied. I think according to some reports, yes, copyright infringement continues uh, to increase steadily, uh, and the type of copyright infringement changes, uh, for example, uh, from, you know, illegal downloading to illegal streaming. Uh, so that's something that uh, is a con current concern because uh, the more effective laws that we have, the more effective pirates are in trying to circumvent those laws. And on the current law when there's a claim for copyright infringement. That, of course, must be heard in federal court. Is that right? Yes. And that applies regardless of the amount in controversy. Is that true? Yes. So if the amount in controversy is $5,000, uh, if someone wants to vindicate that right, they still have to bring a federal court case, correct? Right, yes. Now, I think you mentioned earlier today that the average cost of litigating a case in federal court is approximately $200,000 if you take it to trial. Is that true? Yes, yes. 
So in many instances, the cost of litigating in federal court is often higher than the damages that one may be seeking as a petitioner. Is that true? Yes. Yes, it is. So is it fair to say that as a result of this sort of vexing situation, you have creators, visual artists, others who are left uh, with a right but no remedy to vindicate that right. Is that true? Yeah, and that's one of our key conclusions. And do you support uh, sort of a less burdensome alternative uh, such as a small claims court-like tribunal housed uh, within the Copyright Office? Yes, and we issued um, a full report, as mentioned, uh, recommending the, the creation of just such a court within the Copyright Office uh, in 2013 with our small claims report. And in terms of that 2013 report, um, that system that you recommended, I think, would be overseen uh, by a panel of three copyright experts called the Copyright Claims Board. I don't right? know if we called it the, board, the CCB, but yes, it would essentially be the, the same framework that is in actually the current case act. Okay, and it would allow petitioners and respondents to participate without an attorney and without necessarily appearing in court, is that right? Right, and that's the, the main purpose, allowing people to appear, for example, pro se, so they don't have to spend that $200,000. Um, also, they might be able to utilize, for example, law students who are uh, able to come in and help them. And um, I know under the CASE Act, uh, the uh, claims attorneys who are part of that bill would also be able to help guide uh, those who are pro se in how to file their claims as well, which will be a very helpful aspect of the law. Also, do you think that there's value in having copyright experts who will be part of the tribunal sort of assess the merits of a case and determine what, if any, damages uh, would be available in the context of a dispute? Yes, copyright, off, copyright can off, often be very complex, and that is why we did recommend in our uh, report that uh, the CCB or the whatever small claims tribunal have a, you know, authority by having expertise in copyright law. So at least two of the um, people who would be appointed would actually have to have uh, expertise, both uh, representing copyright owners as well as users. And I think the 2013 report uh, also recommended considering imposing a ceiling on the damages, is that right? Yes. And as far as you understand it, does the CASE Act sort of incorporate those recommendations by setting a $30,000 cap for each dispute uh, and $15,000 per work in terms of claims that are brought before the Copyright Review Board? Uh, yes, and that was our exact recommendation in our 2013 report. Okay, and in terms of the importance of individual artists being able to vindicate their rights under copyright, could you just speak to the significance of it? Many of us have noted that Article I, Section 8, Clause 8 of the United States Constitution, which gives Congress the power uh, to regulate intellectual property law in order to promote the progress of science and useful arts, is sort of at the core of the founding of this nation. And so to have a circumstance where you have artists who have a right but no remedy and can't vindicate that right seems inconsistent with one of the foundational principles of the United States of America. But I'd be interested in your thoughts. Uh, I couldn't say it any better. Um, I will say that I, I, I certainly agree. We have recognized that individual artists and creators are really the backbone of our copyright ecosystem. And so having a system where those individual artists and creators aren't really able to participate and legally enforce their rights really isn't an adequate system at all. And that is why we do support a small claim so that, indiv that those individual artists and creators are able to have a forum in which they can vindicate their rights. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your testimony. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Liu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Temple, for your public service and for being here. Uh, my district in Southern California is home to a lot of creators. Their Music Modernization Act was very important both to America as well as my district, and look forward to your office's implementation of it. My first question is, how will artists and songwriters and creators be able to comment on or give feedback to your office regarding the implementation of the MMA? 
Uh, yes, so they, they have already been able to participate and provide comments um, in response to our uh, designation or our proposed designation of the MLC, which is the first regulatory activity we have under the MMA. Uh, we received over 600 comments from individual artists and others interested in, in, in uh, providing their views as to which uh, entity should be designated as the MLC. And then after we do designate, there are a number of regulatory um, implementation activities that we have to engage in. And for each of those activities, we will go through a formal rulemaking process where we will seek comments from um, all, all of the public and, and especially, of course, those affected by the MMA uh, so that they will be able to participate in that process. So if a creator is watching this and they want to know how to submit a comment, how do they specifically do that? Do you have a website? Do you... Uh Yes, um, we have a website. In fact, um, just the day um, that after the MMA was implemented, we put a specific web page with FAQs about the MMA and the importance of, of the MMA to individual songwriters. Uh, we encourage uh, songwriters and anybody who is interested uh, to come to our website, our music modernization website page, and actually get further information. They can also sign up for um, various notices that we um, put out any time, for example, that we do a, a regulatory process. We will We'll issue a notice. Uh, we will tweet about it, but we will also uh, send it out to our subscribers so they are aware of it. So we encourage them to sign up with the Copyright Office so they can get those types of notices as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, once the Mechanical Licensing Collective is stood up, how will it be held accountable for accurately distributing royalties? Uh, yes, I mean, I think that there are a number of provisions in the MMA that are um, critical uh, and important to ensuring that, the, that whatever des designation what is made that the um, system and the, the entity that is designated will be um, uh, appropriately ensuring that songwriters are actually able to get their royalties. Again, we will have uh, a number of rulemakings to ensure that the process is working effectively. Uh, there are audit right responsibilities in the Music Modernization Act itself uh, that provide that, for example, the MLC will have to provide an audit that will then be made um, public and sent to Congress as well as the, the Copyright Office. And then again, we do have uh, regulatory authority to help to implement um, and effectuate uh, the Music Modernization Act if there is something that we feel um, needs to be clarified, for example. Thank you. I'd like to uh, ask a question on uh, intellectual property theft. A recent study showed that it was around $225 billion in cost to the U.S. What, what are some of your greatest challenges in fighting back against that? Uh I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I'm sorry, against IP theft. Uh, yes, I mean, as, as I said, we aren't an enforcement agency, but, you know, we uh, work closely with the, the, the wider United States government to ensure that, again, the U.S. has strong protections in its law uh, to ensure that we can fight effectively against piracy. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, unfortunately, as we update our law, often the pirates update uh, their activities uh, to try to get around our laws, and so one of the critical, uh, critically important uh, things for us to do is just ensure that our law does keep up to date and that we are able to, and Department of Justice is able to effectively go after the pirates despite or however they are operating uh, so that we can um, ensure that piracy does not continue to rise. And so we are working, you know, continuing to work closely with Congress and with the Department of Justice and others who are interested in ensuring that the laws are kept up to date to, uh, to be able to address the rising cost of piracy. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my understanding of NAFTA 2.0 that's being negotiated is that uh, there's a notice and takedown system for infringement, uh, but that if a member state meets certain legislative requirements, that that's sufficient to comply. Uh, do you believe that both Canada and Mexico uh, will be able to comply and actually enforce that? Yeah, I mean, we work, you know, closely with the interagency on the, in any uh, trade and treaty negotiations. We participated in the um, on the delegations and ensuring that uh, the provisions of the updated U.S. M MCA um, do reflect the uh, U.S.'s position in terms of the strength of IP laws. And we feel that the um, that that the resulting provision is a good one, and that we are hopeful that our trading partners will be able to effectuate that. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman, uh, the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Escobar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for your testimony today and for being here to answer our questions. Only one entity, the Digital Music Association, has made a bid to become the DLC. 
DIMA comprises executives from Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, and SiriusXM. Do you think smaller digital music app platforms or new entrants have been overlooked by these large corporations? Uh, well, I will say that you know the uh, process to be designated as the DLC is an open process. Uh, so anyone who wants to to be considered as a entity to be the, uh, the DLC is is certainly or was certainly um, uh, allowed to provide a submission to be designated. It wasn't limited to just the the um, larger corporations. It just ha so happened we only received um, one submission to be the DLC, unlike the MLC where we did receive two. Um, um, designations. Under the MMA, we don't actually have to choose a DLC. Uh, the, the DLC does have to comply with the statutory requirements of the MMA, so we will thoroughly look at the submission that we receive from the one applicant and ensure that it does reflect the goals of the statutory, statutory provisions, and then we will make a decision as to whether uh, that entity should be designated as the DLC. Okay, thank you. Um, if Congress does not reauthorize the Section 119 license, should it play a role in establishing another market-based alternative, or should the market play out on its own? Yeah, we have said with respect to the Section 119 license specifically um, that, again, uh, that that license has really, um, you know, reached its limit in terms of its effectiveness, and we think that the marketplace itself um, has been able to rise up, so we don't think that there necessarily needs to be an alternative to the Section 119 license, but instead uh, we think that the free market would be uh, appropriate to um, allow for um, those entities um, who had been us using the license to be able to compete effectively. What impact would the reauthorization of this section have on the Copyright Office, and is there any burden in maintaining the section uh, uh, 119 uh, license? Yeah, as, as I said, for, for several years we have recommending we have recommended to Congress that they sunset that license. We will obviously consider continue to administer uh, the license and to distribute royalties if the license does remain. But um, it is something again where the royalties under that license are dropping uh, and they are continuing to drop, and so we just don't see uh, that license as being an effective um, way to support the copyright ecosystem. Instead, we think that the free market um, at this stage again is more appropriate. Uh, so we will continue to administer license if it is uh, reauthorized, but we do strongly believe that um, over the course of the last few years, it's really been obvious that that license is no longer needed and that it should be allowed to be su to sunset. Do you think the Section um, 119 license diminishes the value of copyrights? Well, we have always said that um, for compulsory license, um, which does allow for the use of copyrighted works without the permission uh, of the uh, copyright owner, that they should only be done in instances of true market failure. And so if there isn't a market failure, and right now we don't think that there is, uh, then we don't believe that the compulsory licenses are any, any needed any longer. And that's how the copyright ecosystem should actually work. And so because there's no more uh, market failure with respect to the need for a Section 119 license, since we do think uh, that, again, it is appropriate to allow the market to take over. And what new legal or policy issues does the office foresee becoming important over the next few years? Are you planning on undertaking uh, any new initiatives? Uh, yes, as I mentioned earlier in my testimony, I think in response to a question, we do have our Section 512 study that is still ongoing that we hope to issue uh, by the end of this year. So looking at how effective the Section 512 notice and takedown regime with respect to piracy and the balance that it's supposed to uh, effectuate within the system will be, a, I think, a critical aspect. Uh, we may have recommendations to Congress on that issue. Uh, we are also very interested in uh, Congress potentially addressing the issue of uh, uh, illegal streaming. Again, as I mentioned, right now the penalties are really not um, on par uh, for violations of the unauthorized uh, use of public performances uh, in contrast to the felony penalties that are uh, in our law for uh, violations of the reproduction and distribution rights. So I think uh, looking at illegal streaming is, is certainly an area, and we actually did re just recently receive a letter from Congress from the Senate side on this, uh, this particular issue that we will be responding to in the coming weeks as well. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and may I add my congratulations to you, Director Temple, for your recent appointment. It's terrific and exciting. 
I wanted to ask you two areas of inquiry, some of which you've touched upon, um, but in particular, uh, you mentioned the analysis of overall workforce needs in your 2020 study. So when you look at needs, uh, I'm wondering, wondering specifically what area uh, areas are you looking at, and what do you hope might be some of your takeaways? What are some of the biggest challenges and threats? Um, so, a little more information on the 2020 study. Yes, in, in terms of the copyright office workforce needs. Yes. Um, so one of the things that you know we have said that is that when we are modernizing the copyright office, we don't. I mean, we we know it's critical to focus on IT, but we don't want to just focus on IT. We want to mo modernize our entire systems. Uh, we want to make sure that our workflow and our processes are really being modernized as well. We want to make sure that we have the right positions uh, that reflect either our new IT systems or the new ways that um, we are going to um, have to do our job. So right now we do have, um, we are working on having uh, several contractors come in to assist us with that process. We already have the Office of Personnel Management um, in our office right now, which are um, looking at our um, position descriptions and our positions to make sure that, for example, they're adequately graded, we have enough. Uh, they will be in the office uh, until 2020, uh, and then they will issue a study on that issue. Then we are also going to be engaging with a contractor to help us with business process engineering, looking at the workflow aspects of our um, office to make sure, again, that we have the most effective and efficient processes. And then we are finally looking at organizational change management. Uh, we are going to bring in a contractor to help us with that area as well. We understand in a business transformation of this magnitude, uh, it's critical that we have the buy-in of all of our staff and that they understand um, how there are, their positions may change and are supportive of that. And so we're going to have a consultant come in to help us with that. So we have a number of areas that we are working on to kind of support IT modernization and modernization of the office as a whole that really aren't focused exclusively on the IT development side. Are you also looking at diversity and inclusion across the board in the organization? I serve on the Diversity and Inclusion Subcommittee in Financial Services, uh, and it's interesting to take a look at organizations. I had a roundtable in my district. Uh, we had business, we had law enforcement, we had educational leaders. Uh, as part of your study, are you looking also at that, uh, not just a percentage of diversity, women, people of color, um, those who are disabled, all kinds of diversity, but across the spectrum of the Copyright Office? Uh, yes, you know, I take those issues very seriously myself personally. Uh, we are working with the library. The library actually just did um, uh, develop a group uh, library-wide to look at diversity and inclusion issues. So we have a, uh, my senior advisor, actually a direct report of mine, is actually working on that group. So she is um, going to be helping the library, you know, library-wide in terms of those initiatives and is also spearheading those initiatives for me uh, personally within the Copyright Office. Some of my uh, common sense takeaways from having conversations about that is, number one, sometimes people just think their offices are diverse, and then they actually take a moment to look around, and then they find they aren't. So it's being sort of deliberate and intentional about making sure you're, you're looking at that. Uh, and number two is sort of setting goals. So uh, I'm delighted you're looking at that. I'll flip real quick in one minute I have remaining. Can you tell us about any plans you have to evaluate or potentially outsource additional functions, privatizing any functions that you um, might be doing, or are you trying to, in your overall study and modernization, uh, not do that kind of outsourcing? Yeah, I mean, I will say that I think we think that it's important that um, the copyright system of the United States is run by um, the United States and is, is controlled by the Copyright Office. Uh, so that is uh, something is the, the main focus. We are, of course, looking at creative options for for resources and funding. Uh, so, example, for example, we are exploring the possibility of for, uh, no cost contracting as part of the way to fund our IT modernization. Uh, so, while we think it's important to to maintain the Copyright Office IT systems within the Copyright Office, we are certainly willing and are looking, you know, right now at ways to creatively fund uh, that the development of that system. Terrific. Thank you, Director Temple. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I yield the remainder of my time. The remainder of your time, the uh, gentlelady from California, uh, Ms. Bass. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, let me join everyone else in congratulating you on your position, and I enjoyed our conversation. Look forward to working with you. Uh, the Music Modernization Act presents a unique opportunity to address inequities artists of color have faced for decades due to a lack of access and representation. 
Today, there has been a 72% increase in on-demand audio streaming. Hip-hop surpassed rock as the most popular in terms of total consumption in the United States. And nine out of 10 most streamed songs in 2018 were hip-hop songs. African-American and Latinx artists, hip-hop and R&B accounted for 29.7% of all streams in 2018, more than doubling rock. This is also at a time when Latin music has experienced record-breaking revenue growth due to streaming in both English and Spanish. The MLC will be tasked with ensuring that owners of music composition copyrights receive royalty payments and maintain a music ownership database that will allow copyright owners to stake claims to their songs. So it's critical that the thought leadership driving this process reflects every type of music copyright owner. So when considering an entity responsible for the mechanical, <clears throat> excuse me, licensing collective, have you considered the issue of diversity or encouraged diversity in its leadership? Uh, I will say, uh, yes, that is, is certainly an issue that we have um, heard some concerns about from some of the commenters who have participated in our rulemaking process. Uh, we, um, by statute, of course, the MLC does have to, uh, the, the, the entity that is designated as the MLC does has to, to have to represent, um, the be endorsed by and, and supported by uh, the largest number of musical work copyright owners or the largest percentage of musical work copyright owners. And so that will, uh, by statute, statute ensure uh, that the MLC does have a kind of a diverse representation in terms of the types of artists uh, that it will be it will have on its board. Uh, we, we did receive one comment or a couple of comments about just the diversity in terms of ethnicity and race on the board as well. Uh, we were pleased that in response to those comments we did ask uh, questions of both MLCs and both who had uh, who have um, proposed to be designated as the MLC have actually uh, submitted um, comments to us uh, committing to actually uh, having a diverse and considering a diverse board. Uh, so we were, were very pleased uh, by the response that we received uh, from both of the entities proposing to be designated that this is an issue that they take seriously. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Uh, some have argued that the new blanket licensing system flips the burden from digital service providers to the rights holders and songwriters. Jeff Price, a board member of the American Music Licensing Collective, which is one of the candidates for the Mechanical Licensing Collective, said that, quote, unlike before where the digital service providers would have to find you and pay you, now you have to know about the MLC regardless of where you are on the planet. So how do you respond to these concerns and are they addressed in your designation process? Well, I think that partially they're actually addressed in the uh, Music Modernization Act language itself. Uh, there is an obligation on the part of the entity that is designated as the MLC uh, to make sure that they do outreach activities uh, to alert songwriters to the need to sign up with do the you, MLC. Do you know how they would do, how they would conduct the outreach? Yes, I mean, that is something that we did actually ask for information on um, from both of the uh, designee, and so that is actually, uh, in terms of how they plan on doing it, that is something that that anyone can go on our website and see some of their plans uh, in terms of outreach. Um, they are also uh, supposed to work with the DLC once it's designated, and the DLC itself is also supposed to provide outreach activities um, to those who come to their platforms, letting them know that uh, the, the MLC exists and that they're encouraged to sign up. And then separately, the Copyright Office also has um, statutory responsibilities under the MMA to provide outreach and education activities. And so we are committed uh, once the uh, designation occurs uh, to take seriously those activities and really ensure that we can do our part in supporting the operation of the MLC and ensuring that songwriters are aware of um, the need to participate to ensure that they are able to get paid and get their royalties. And, and do you have a way of monitoring how that outreach is going? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the uh, main issues is to ensure that there are not a large number of unclaimed funds remaining in the MLC, mm -hmm. and that is why um, it is important for um, us to conduct the study on best practices to reduce the amount of unclaimed funds, and so I think that will be a key area, us reviewing um, the practices of the MLC once it's designated, as well as best practices overall, and making recommendations uh, to Congress and to the MLC itself um, in terms of, uh, again, best practices to reduce the amount of unclaimed royalties that they might have. Thank you very much. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from uh, North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know you had spoke with Mr. Klein and Ms. Roby and touched on digital piracy, and you spoke to the Copyrights Office role on this subject. I'd like to highlight some findings from a recent U.S. Chamber of Commerce and NERA Consulting issued a study on the impacts of digital video piracy on the U.S. economy. As of 2018, there were more video streaming subscribers compared to paid TV subscribers, approximately 500 license online, and approximately 500 online licensed online video portals. 26.6 billion viewings of U.S. films were digitally privated each, or pirated each year, costing over $29 billion annually. You mentioned that this harms not only the content creators, but also the broader economy. And I know that you, your office is not the enforcement agency, but can you explain current enforcement authority to prevent such piracy? Um, yes, the, the current enforcement authority is, you know, handled by the Department of Justice. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we do work with them closely on policy issues with respect to um, IP rights and updating our laws. We also work closely with the Department of Justice, the Patent and Trademark Office, and other parts of their agency uh, to ensure that our trading partners also have strong IP laws in their regimes. And so that's one thing that we do when we support the interagency on treaty, tre treaty and trade negotiations uh, to, again, ensure that the, the global copyright ecosystem does uh, protect strongly the, the, the uh, copyrights of individuals and of businesses. And I'm assuming pirating technology is always, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a constant battle, which will be to my next question. And no matter how many enforcement agents we have, I mean, if there's 26.6 .6 billion pirated viewings, I mean, you're not going to get it at the viewer side. You have to get it where it's being pirated. I, I mean, I, I, I just can't imagine the monumental task that this is. <laughs> Yes, it, it certainly is a monumental task, and I think that is why um, there's just not one way to address it. Certainly, uh, you know, making sure that we have a strong IP framework is, is an important aspect of it. Um, but, uh, you know, we're also encouraged by voluntary initiatives where, um, the, you know, digital platforms and content creators are working together voluntarily to address this issue. Uh, so that's another area that, you know, can really help to combat the rising piracy as well. And, you'd rec and you recommended that we continually update our laws to keep up with piracy. Um, what, I, what policy changes, I mean, can we make either in the laws themselves or allowing these agencies to adapt more quickly to better protect this content? Yes, as I said, you know, making sure that we um, are reflecting the way that piracy occurs is one of the most important things that we need to do. So updating our laws, for example, to, to provide for, um, you know, felony penalties for illegal streaming uh, is something that, again, we strongly support and have supported in the past. We are, as I mentioned earlier, also reviewing the notice and takedown regime of Section 512 to, to see whether uh, it's still providing the balance that Congress intended and whether there are areas that need to be tweaked um, in that either through legislative change or through additional voluntary initiatives. And so those are some of the ways that both Congress and the Copyright Office can uh, help to uh, ensure that piracy is combated. And I guess this is just kind of my last question, and I'm not sure there's an answer for it, but we do a really good job of, well, I hope, sometime, I hope at least sometimes we do a really good job of dealing with the issue in front of us. But in this, in this universe, how do we promulgate policy that allows us to deal with something we don't even know exists yet that could come on the horizon in six months. Right. I mean, that, is, again, is, is the perennial issue in terms of trying to get a, ahead of the, the pirates. Anytime we have new technology, um, you know, new technology can often be used by pirates as well. Um, so I think, again, um, having a multi-pronged process to get out ahead of it is important, uh, ensuring that our copyright laws are kept updated, but also ensuring that there are effective ways for, um, you know, the industries themselves on a voluntary basis to work together to address piracy, I think, is an important aspect as well. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from uh, Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's stunning that we have not had a hearing uh, since 2015, so I congratulate the chairman and ranking member for a very important hearing, and as well congratulate uh, Ms. Temple for her appointment moving from so many different positions, but now the person, and so again, congratulations to you and your team. Um, I too want to focus on the uh, Music Modernization Act and also the question of uh, modernization uh, dealing with the um, technology in, in your office, uh, which I think is extremely important. 
the um, status of the Copyright Office IT, um, and at the same time, uh, what kind of firewalls are you putting in place uh, to avoid hacking um, the uh, infringement from foreign adversaries, to be very honest, because uh, what you have uh, may have some measure of intelligence to it uh, in terms of its uh, quality or value to international operators. But let me uh, raise this point. Some have argued that the new blanket licensing system flips the burden from digital service providers to the rights holders and songwriters. Jeff Price, a board member of the American Music Licensing Collective, AMLC, which is one of the candidates for the Mechanical Licensing Collective, said that unlike before when the digital service providers would have to find you and pay you, now you have to know about the MLC regardless of where you are in the planet. So how do you respond to these concerns and are they addressed in your designation process, question number one? And Price also estimates that the new system could leave four to five billion of accrued royalties undistributed, which concerns me. I've lived with the music licensing issue and trying to balance it for many years in this committee and we did make great progress in, in the past uh, year. Price also estimates, um, and so what measures can be taken to ensure that rights owners are properly compensated and not unduly burdened in collecting that compensation? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. This, again, is, is a, a very important one, and it's a critical part of the whatever entity is designated that they ensure uh, that they reduce the amount of unclaimed royalties. I will say that we are unaware of where uh, Mr. Price got the figure of four to five billion. Uh, that did not come in in any of the uh, comments that we received in terms of um, the possibility of unclaimed royalties, so we would be interested in, in terms of where that estimate is coming from. Uh, but we do think, again, that there are specific provisions in the statute that will help to reduce those unclaimed royalties. Uh, again, in, in addition to this having to be a priority of whichever entity is designated, um, by statute the entity has to create an unclaimed royalties uh, a committee to review these issues. Uh, they have to provide audits uh, to ensure that they are operating effectively. Those audits are going to be made available to Congress and to the, the Copyright Office. And then again, we will be undertaking a full study that will seek comments from all of those who are affected by the MMA uh, to ensure that there are best practices implemented by the MLC uh, to reduce the amount of unclaimed royalties. And again, that study will be issued uh, in uh, July of 2021. So your action item would be that you'll be studying the processes that have been established. Well, let me follow up by saying, under Title I of the Music Modernization Act, digital music providers such as Spotify and Apple Music will soon be able to obtain a blanket license. So how will the Copyright Office help ensure that the transition to the blanket license system will be seamless? Uh, yes, um, we are you know, committed to, to helping to make sure that that process works effectively. Uh, we, again, immediately uh, upon the passage of the MMA, uh, issued certain rules and regulations that were required primarily for the pre-1972 sound recordings part of the MMA, and then now are in the process of implementing regulations for uh, the Section 115 aspect of the MMA. Uh, once we designate the MLC and the DLC, uh, we will then work closely on implementing regulations uh, again, we have to do regulations such as the form and type of notices of blanket license, uh, the form uh, and type of notices of license activity, uh, usage reports, usability issues, interoperability issues, as well as privacy and confidential, uh, con uh, consideration of let privacy me, and confidential information. So we have a lot of work to do, right. uh, and we are committed to so Let me get these two other that. questions in. Um, uh, let me try to understand how your IT is working to avoid breaching and security breaches, and then two, your outreach to minorities who need that kind of outreach as you go forward to understand this process. Uh, yes, so in terms of um, IT modernization and the security of our systems, that is a primary goal of our office to ensure that our systems are secure. Uh, we obviously take in a lot of very important and valuable information, uh, both just information as well as the data and deposits themselves. Uh, so we think it is critical that the, the copyright office... Minority outreach? Hmm? Minority outreach? 
And the minority outreach, in terms of minority outreach, you know, again, that's a critical area. We are expanding and have expanded our outreach and education program uh, recently. We are, we just recently had um, uh, some students actually from the Hispanic Bar Association in our office um, to encourage them to seek uh, IP law as a, an appropriate career. I just recently uh, spoke at the Howard University about copyright and social justice, which is something that a lot of people don't equate copyright with, but um, copyright is an aspect of social social justice. Uh, so that is an area that I personally am interested in and that we have been pursuing in recent uh, months as Thank well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Deutsch. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding the hearing. Um, thanks to our witness for being here, and uh, congratulations on your formal nomination. Um, I, um, I know you've been doing the job for quite a while, and uh, I appreciate your service and willingness to lead the office Thank into you. the 21st century. Um, I just want to follow up um, on some of the questions that uh, my friends, Mr. Nadler and Ms. Jackson, have already touched on. Uh, as co-chair of the Songwriters Caucus with my friend Congresswoman Roby, we meet with songwriters from across the country, and there's been a good discussion about the MLC and, and compiling the information for the MLC and matching the information to songwriters. I just, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood on the issue of, uh, of market share Market share is going to be determined based on screaming and uh, streaming and, and ownership information. But obviously, if the database is incomplete, then payments could end up poorly representing the um, the actual marketplace. The statute provides discretion. I just wanted to, to reemphasize some of what has already been discussed about the focus being on a, on uh, making sure that this is done right. Obviously, not not focusing solely on accomplishing a task in time for a deadline which would then lead to rushing to make payments from uh, unmatched funds before the database is complete, uh, as complete as possible anyway, and making sure that the pool is as small as possible. That is, that's the way you're approaching it. I just want to confirm that. Uh, yes, and, and we were again uh, pleased that both of the designees or both of the entities that want it to be designated as the MLC agreed with the interpretation that unclaimed funds cannot be distributed until 2023. So that will ensure whoever's designated as the MLC um, time to actually develop a framework to reduce the amount of unclaimed funds. Great, I appreciate that. Um, second, as you know, Cloudflare is a large company, provides a number of services related to internet security and the delivery of content over the internet. There's no doubt services are valuable to its many legitimate law-abiding customers. Uh, indeed, I've recently seen reports that the Copyright Office uses its services as well. Uh, I've also seen, however, some concerning reports of what appears to be a, a, a darker side of the use of Cloudflare, uh, describing its widespread provision of services to known bad actors, including hate speech sites, counterfeiters, uh, even terror groups, according to one of the reports that I read. Um, and I just ask whether you would agree to review the Copyright Office's use of Cloudflare in light of these really disturbing reports. Uh, yes, no, that, that is an important question. As you know, post-centralization of IT within the library, um, those issues are decided by OCIO, the, the librarians OCIO. We have raised this issue in light of stakeholders' concern with OCIO that um, some have uh, questioned uh, the use of that particular entity, and so we are um, hopeful that they will review that issue. You, so you've raised it and asked them to do what? We asked them to review the issue to see if it's appropriate for them to use that entity. Um, okay, I appreciate that, and we'd appreciate being kept abreast of those, uh, that analysis as well. Um, I'd, like, um, um, I'd like to ask about uh, the, the fast-paced nature of creation and publication online today. Um, photo journalists obviously tweet images of breaking news. Artists and poets uh, post moving works on Instagram. Authors now write on blogs. And the, this modern day publishing gets done in an instant. And um, the, the tools make it incredibly easy to share creative content online, but obviously there are challenges for your office. Um, if you could talk about some of the challenges and opportunities that you see as you work to keep pace with protecting those creators who share their work online, who are doing really important work, uh, creators who are fortunate to have copyright protection, but if they don't have the benefit of statutory damages, uh, the, their work th then in the blink of an eye um, 
is then put at risk. So if you could just talk about how you see this going forward. Yes, and we know that this is a critical issue. Obviously, um, in, in order to get statutory damages, they have to um, have registered within a, a certain amount of time with the Copyright Office, and so we want to make sure that, again, as we develop a modernized system, we make it as easy as possible to register and also to register a, you know, a high volume of works. We understand, for example, ph photographers will um, take thousands of pictures in one se session. Uh, right now, we have a group registration registration option for photographers that it does allow them to provide um, up to 750 photographs with us at one time. And that's to ease the burden of individual filings of uh, copyright registration applications. In the future, has we that, If I can just ask, has that been successful since, since February when it was implemented? Well, well, I will say, you know, it's been successful in the sense that it allows the Copyright Office to um, adequately use its resources to you know, handle a large volume of photographs. We do understand that there are some concerns by from photograph photographers that that number is too low. And so, one of the things that we are looking at as we, you know, again continue to modernize, are whether there are ways that we can use technology that we would be able to, to more quickly review those types of claims where there's their high volume claims. And so that yes, we would be able to raise that limit beyond 750 if we're able to use technology. Um, again, one of the things that we would love to do is, for example, allow people to register through their mobile telephone so that they're able to do it easily, uh, use APIs to be able to be interoperable with our office. So those are some of the areas that we're exploring in terms of modernization right now. Terrific. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks. Gentle lady from Texas, Ms. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, uh, Ms. Temple, thank you for being here, and I do congratulate you. And I do apologize, I did have another hearing um, uh, that I'm sort of bouncing around from one to the other. But so if I ask anything that you've already talked about, please um, excuse me. But I wanted to start with picking up with my colleague and fellow Houstonian left off, uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. In the blanket license that you're going to be able to give now to Spotify and Apple Music, uh, is there a reason that a blanket license was chosen versus the, the old song-by-song song licensing, and will that cause any additional challenges uh, for you? Uh, yes, yeah, so a, a blanket license was, was chosen to really um, effect, further effectuate the um, efficiency of the music licensing system. The old song-by-song uh, song license, I mean, as you uh, can realize, these in, individual um, services are using millions and millions of works, uh, so they, uh, if they cannot find the uh, songwriter or copyright owner um, in our you know, database, they will have to file it. For example, they had to file notices with the Copyright Office to be able to um, get a license under Section 115. We received received in millions of individual NOIs uh, pr pursuant to that song-by-song song license uh, approach. And so that really was not the most efficient way to, to market um, or music licensing and under... Do you see any issues arising uh, from that? Uh, arising from the... Um, from doing the blanket license? No, I mean, I think that, you know, this is, again, something that the Copyright Office has actually reviewed for several years. Um, we supported um, the creation of a uh, blanket license under Section 115 um, for many, many years, even before our Section 115 report in 2015. Uh, so this is something that we think will actually further support the efficiency of the music licensing market and actually allow songwriters to get paid more effectively. Right. And I wanted to uh, also talk a little bit about the piracy issue. Uh, I, I realize the DOJ does the enforcement, you do not, but, but, but what steps are you taking or are you taking any steps now uh, to, to, um, to kind of monitor and create the data? And, and can you share with us today if there's, since you started doing it, if you're already doing it, how big the increase is? Is it as big as we think or, or we don't even know the full, full of it? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get out of ahead of us in terms of the fact that we're actually right now doing a, in the process of completing our report under Section 512, and so we'll have some more um, specific data once that report is, is released. When will that be released? Uh, so that will be released by the end of this year. 
Okay. Um, and so that is, again, one of the uh, areas that we're working on on the policy side to ensure that um, our laws are kept updated to deal with uh, piracy. Again, we also work with uh, the interagency to ensure that our copyright framework, both domestically and uh, internationally, is strong. Uh, so we do support um, delegations uh, for treaty and trade negotiations as well. And then finally, you know, I think the U.S. government has um, been interested in supporting, if it can, voluntary initiatives between digital platforms and content creators to see if there are things that they can do even outside of specific laws to address this issue voluntarily. Well, but to assure the public today, I mean, you are, you are telling me that, that, that you are monitoring yes. and you are looking at it. Uh, and you're looking at it not only here in, in the continental U.S., but, but you're looking at it globally? Yes, that is a, you know, we have a full international policy affairs, uh, policy, policy affairs uh, department that actually helps assist, um, again, the rest of the United States government as they look at these issues. Uh, we often review, for example, the laws of other countries to see if they re reflect the strong IP framework that we have here in the United States, and we will provide um, suggestions to them to consider as they're updating their laws to ensure that, again, that they're effectively addressing um, piracy as well. And, and, the, and you, as a representative of the United States, are, are fully engaged and fully participating in any global forums or, um, you know, coalitions that are looking at this, at this topic. Yes, we, um, you know, by statute, um, participate in foreign delegations, as mentioned. We work very, very closely with the United States Trade Representative. We also serve on delegations to the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, so that's something that we um, do regularly. Right. Very quickly, I, I just want to go on record as being supportive of the, of the small claims court. I think anything we can do to make it easier uh, for the average, uh, everyday American to be able to uh, go through this process uh, would be very helpful to, to many people that, that we represent. And I hope that you can support that and assist in any way you can if, if that were to become the law. Yes, we do fully support that. All right. Thank you. Uh, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady yields back. The gentlelady from Arizona, Ms. Lesko. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Temple. And I think since uh, you're going to be done pretty soon, because I think I'm the last one over here, at least. Um, I think there was questions already answered, because I was going to talk about um, uh, Stellar and the reauthorization or your recommendation not to reauthorize it. And um, I was told somebody asked you what will happen to the satellite subscribers that utilize Section 119 license. But more specifically, uh, you know, I have concerns about maybe the people that have recreational vehicles, um, truckers, uh, those type of, of folks. What, what are their options going to be? And are you considering grandfathering in some customers? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, as I said earlier, uh, we've looked at this issue for many years. We do think that the usage of that license has really dropped significantly, um, and so that there will not be a significant market harm um, to those rural com communities that rely have relied um, on the license in the past, and that the free market will allow for, um, you know, other entities to come up and to allow for the actual um, usage of um, various satellite transmissions. So we don't think that it needs to be be done rather through a compulsory license, but it can be done through the free marketplace. And uh, Ms. Temple, since I wasn't here for your answer, how, how many people, how many consumers utilize uh, that service? So right now, I, I think it was mentioned earlier that um, there was an estimate that there were about 800,000 subscribers, and I think you mentioned that in your testimony as well. Um, one of the issues that we recognize is that uh, it, it, it's not clear, and we did ask, I think, that question um, of the services exactly um, what types of uh, subscriptions uh, they're reflecting. Are they household subscriptions or others? And so that is one issue that um, we are seeking further information on. Uh, and Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I guess I just want to say, um, please keep in mind these these people. And even though it's a relatively small number, I know that uh, when when the service is taken away, I, I assume they're not going to be happy. So I'll, if you can get some more information on that, and I'll try to find out how many of these subscribers are in my district. And so thank you very much, Ms. Temple, and I yield back. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back. Gentlelady yields back. Uh, being no further uh, questioners, this concludes today's hearing.
We thank the witness for attending and for her work. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witness or additional materials for the record. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.